So what we'll be doing today, we have two modules. Um, the first module, about one and a half hours uh, each. Uh, the first module is going to be mostly theory. And I will go to all the steps that you sort of need to be aware of in order to deploy SSL and TLS securely. And then in the second uh, part, that will be entirely hands-on, we will go through as many exercises as, as, as you want to go through. Um, hopefully you will have seen the, the instructions. Uh, so the exercises I have in the instructions, there's quite a few of those. I mean, it, it, there's no way that you can cover it in one hour and a half. Uh, and I'm entirely happy for you to pick your own set of exercises if you wish to. So if you already have some SSL and TLX experience, maybe you want to do the more, more challenging bits. If you, want to, if you don't, maybe you want to do the beginning bits. It's entirely up to you. I'm happy to assist you in, in any way that, 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 uh, that I can. So without uh, uh, further uh, delay, I'm going to start talking. There's, there's a, usually what I do with this, this module, this is, this is part of a larger thing I do. I, I sometimes uh, teach people TLS. I teach this module after a full day of theory. Um, so you know, in, in, in that case, usually people you know, have some idea what's coming. And they, for certain things that I say, um, you know, they sort of know what, why I'm saying them. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to uh, keep things informal. So if you have any questions, just raise your hand and ask them. And then we'll talk about whatever is, you know, whatever is more important for you. Um, we, both, we have an, uh, about an hour and a half, and I think that will be enough uh, to, to, for you to go to the basics. The reason why I like giving uh, uh, my book, uh, uh, using my book as, as, uh, as uh, training materials is because it's quite comprehensive. So that, along with the set of exercises I gave you, allows you to go home and continue researching uh, these things at your own pace. If you don't want to research any further, uh, that's fine, but if you do, you, know, you, you have the materials uh, there. I will tell you that the, the stuff that I'm, I'll be talking about uh, right now are chapters eight and nine of the book. So everything, chapters one to seven, is largely about the context and the background for, for things, and why uh, uh, there are in-depth in explanations to why certain things are the way they are. And then chapters 8 and chapters 9, uh, they talk about secure configuration. And chapter 9 talks about performance. Then there's chapter 10, which is sort of some, some somewhat advanced topics. And those three chapters, 8, 9, and 10, are sort of the core chapters of the book. Everything sort of revolves around them. And then from chapters 11 onward, it's really practical work. So it's all about how, do, how you use OpenSSL for configuration and for testing. And they have one, I have one chapter each for uh, Apache, Nginx, uh, Microsoft, and Java. So if you, if you uh, have a web server, which is one of these, then you, you would just pick that one chapter that you're interested in. You might need some of those chapters. For example, some of the exercises are about uh, configuring a, a web server. There's not a lot of it, but you will find that you, you, th there's, for example, the Nginx chapter, in, which explains how to configure SSL. Anyhow. Um, the way I'm going to start is I'm going to build a foundation. So I'm starting from the, from the, bo from the bottom up. And uh, with TLS, the bottom is private keys. Uh, basically, on every server that you have, what you do, you create a unique cryptographic identity for that server. And that really means creating a private key. And uh, for private keys, we, uh, we use asymmetric cryptography. So basically, what, what that means is there's a private key and there's a public key. You keep your private key private and you give your public key to everyone. So if you want to, have to be secure, your private keys need to be secure. And uh, what we do, uh, you have two choices when it comes to private keys. You can use RSA private keys. And this is something I, I recommend to everyone to use by default. Uh, if you choose an RSA key, uh, every single device out there will support it. So that's the easy default, default choice. You can also use a uh, something that's called elliptic, elliptic curve uh, uh, DCA, ECDSA. These type of keys are more secure and they're faster. Uh, however, they also come with a disadvantage that not 100%, it's not, the coverage is not 100%. So some older devices might not support them. So it really depends on what, sort of type, what type of site you have. If you're looking at a site that's intended for use for a very wide, by a very wide audience, then it's, I mean, you should really stick to RSA keys. If you have a modern user base, you could use ECDSA keys. Uh, I will tell you that it doesn't really matter. 
uh, in virtually all cases, you'll be absolutely fine with RSA keys and that's that. Um, I will uh, recommend, I mentioned that there's another key type, there's a, they're called DCA keys. Um, these, these keys are virtually unused on the internet and they're a dead end because their size is limited by, 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 um, by the fact that Internet Explorer doesn't support uh, anything stronger than I forget, I think 1024 bits universally and then that's, that's weak, too weak to use. So, um, as I said, use the RSA key. If you want to use ECDSA keys, um, because people want to use them for, for performance, what's happening right now is that people are starting to deploy two types of keys in the same server at the same time. And this is really interesting. However, not all web software supports this mode of operation well. And this is a mode of operation that you will have to use if you really want to get 100% coverage. And the idea is that if a modern client comes to you, you give them the ECDSA key. If an older client comes to you, you give them an RSA key. And unfortunately, this is really immature and it's, it's going to improve in the next year or two. Uh, right now, if you want to go into this, this direction, expect that you will have to do a lot of work. So, uh, once you select the uh, key type, you need to select the key size. And the, the, the challenge here is um, uh, that different types of private key algorithm use different key sizes. So th these are things that you will have to memorize. Um, one thing is for RSA, the default size today is 2048 bits. And if you go to a certification authority to get a certificate, they will not give you a certificate for anything that's less than 2048. And this is not sort of the ideal of security. Uh, however, again, for virtually all size, 2048 bits is, 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 is perfectly fine. If you go and use ECDSA keys, uh, the default is 256 bits, and that is equivalent to 3072 bits of RSA. So easy keys are stronger and faster, um, and so that's, that's, another, that's another reason why some people, uh, some people like them. And that's pretty much all you need to know about keys. Uh, that, that, that area is sort of very straightforward. I think uh, what I'd like to sort of mention briefly is that generating keys securely and making sure that you have these secure keys, that's not a problem, that's never a problem. You will be able to, you know, you will generate your keys today and it will take you about 15 seconds and you will configure them correctly and whatnot. Um, a bigger problem uh, and when it comes to cryptography and encryption is key management. And I think even when we're talking about TLS, it's not a big problem. In most cases, uh, TLS keys uh, can be thrown away. They're, I mean, because they are typically used only for server authentication. Uh, you use them for a period of time. If you lose them, it's not a big deal. You can just uh, get a new, generate a new set of keys and then you continue to use this, this uh, uh, new set of keys. In, most, uh, in some other protocols, that's not the case. You actually have to uh, keep your keys for a very long time. You have to rotate them. You have to know exactly wh where you use your keys and for how long and so on and so forth. So TLS, unless you're using something called uh, public key pinning, uh, which I will talk about later, in general with key, ma key management is really easy. However, you still need to be aware that you know, there's some good management practices uh, that you need to follow. For example, you always need to keep uh, these keys um, uh, make sure that they are not available to a wide number of people. So uh, we, we typically in, in maybe in your operations in a system administration environment, may, you need to make sure that the smallest amount of people can get to a particular key. The other thing is if you are sharing certificates and you have two different systems, you will actually have to share, the, uh, share, share private keys as well. And th this gets really tricky because if you have a, a larger organization at all, and they all share the same certificates, then it's uh, a member of one team can actually attack uh, the, the, this other system, even though, st uh, strictly speaking, they don't have any, any connection to this other key. So my sort of general recommendations are to simply uh, make sure that to treat your keys as a special asset and keep track of who has access uh, to, uh, to them. If someone leaves your organization, you simply regenerate and create new keys so to make sure that you know, they don't leave with and take the keys with them. Also, uh, always password protect the keys. Uh, the reason why I insist on password protecting keys is that uh, if you perform, when you uh, rather uh, go and back up your keys, uh, someone can actually compromise your backup infrastructure and get your keys from there and uh, you know, compromise you that way. If your key is a password protected, then normally, of course, you don't uh, store this passphrase in, in the same place where you store your keys. 
then you, you're, you're fine. Even a backup compromise is not going to, is not going to do anything bad. Uh, generally speaking, uh, you should rotate your keys uh, periodically. And what I normally recommend is that you rotate your certificates at least once a year and use that opportunity to rotate your keys as well. Uh, unless you're using pinning, uh, again, and I'll, I'll talk about that later, there's no reason to re you, you reuse your keys. And it's actually better to, to, to rotate. And that's all uh, about keys. Um, moving on to uh, any questions at this point? I, I feel like we need to break the ice a bit and make it. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I, I've been recommending that uh, you would use a separate set of keys for each server. Yes. Do you think that that's okay? I think it's, everything is a balance of usability and how much time you spend towards, um, uh, towards uh, ensuring security. I think. Uh, if you use a separate key on separate server, you'll have to use a separate certificate for that server. Yes. So if you, have, if you have five servers that cover uh, the same domain name, I think it's going to be really challenging to have five different keys because you will have five different certificates. Well, I, I'd argue against that key because I put the, domain, uh, the hosting in the certificate as well. And then it actually becomes easier to, to know which certificate. No, but if it's the same site. I'm saying if, if, if the five servers are for the, for the same side, that, that's challenging because you will need five certificates. If you have five completely different set, set, sets of services, then I would argue for separate keys as well. Especially now, as you'll see later on, you can get keys for free and you can fully automate the renewal. So it, it's absolutely fine. Once you, the way you should really work is that you embed uh, key generation and certificate generation and embed that in your images, in your server images. Servers themselves can now, especially for TLS, where it's not important when you lose your keys, servers themselves can generate them and, and, and you actually make sure that uh, you have separate. The reason why key rotation is important, uh, it used to be much more important than it, than it is. I'm, so I'm going to cover, talk about briefly, talk briefly about uh, forward, secure, uh, forward secrecy. Um, you know, there are two reasons why you need to rotate uh, your keys. In general, in cryptography, it's always good um, to uh, change and renew your key material. Because, you know, some of that key material is always going to be associated with the services you provide. So it's when you get rid of the key material, you've, sort of, you've gotten rid of a certain liability. The other reason to rotate keys and certificates often is that it, you, you become accustomed to doing rota the rotation. And it becomes part of your operational proficiency. Uh, for example, at Google, they rotate their, so their certificates quarterly, and that's part of their routine. So they're never going to forget to do it. If you get your certificates for three years, and you, if you're not be really careful, you just forget to do it. And then after three years, I mean, you, you find out about your certificates expired by someone telling you, oh, yeah, your website is not working. So that's, that's generally not a good idea. However, the be best reason for rot key rotation is forward secrecy. And in TLS, we have sort of different uh, key exchanges. And key exchange is uh, the initial part, part of a connection where two parties agree to communicate how, how exactly they're going to communicate sec securely. And TLS is quite flexible and has several of these key exchanges. Unfortunately, one of them is called the RSA key exchange. And, when, and th this used to be the major, 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 by far the most widely deployed key exchange. In this key exchange, Actually, every single connection is, uh, uh, actually has a bond to the private key, the server's private key. And if you have a, a powerful adversary who is really recording all the network traffic, initially they can't do anything about it because it's encrypted, so they can't break it, it's strong and so on and so forth. But what, can, what they can do, they can continue to record it for months and years if they need to, and then at some point in the future they simply get hold of your private keys. And they can get a, get a court order to do it. They can uh, exploit a zero day. They can pay one of the system administrators to do it. As soon as they get hold of that private key, they can use it to decrypt all the recorded pre previously recorded co connections. And that's terrible. So in this situation, uh, private keys are a terrible liability. So if you're rotating them, say, once a quarter, even once a month, and no one has them, if you destroy them, no one can get them from you. And then that means that your, um, your communication is safe. Now there's a better way. Uh, there are certain key exchanges uh, that are recommended today. They have this feature uh, attribute called forward secrecy. And because it's a different type of key exchange, 
uh, there's no bond between the private key and the, the, the handshake. Uh, the private key is used just for authentication at the beginning, and the key exchange is actually entirely separate. And so that's, that's why it's sort of ne not uh, as important these days to rotate keys, but you know, it's, still, it's still very much recommended. So this, well, all, all what, I, what, what I'll be teaching today is about TLS 1.2, essentially. Um, I'll mention TLS 1.3 from, from, from time to time. Uh, this, is, this is a new uh, release of the TLS protocol, and they've been working on it for a, quite a few years now. I'm sort of expecting they will re release it this year. TLS 1.3 cuts away lots of craft that's accumulated in TLS over the years. And for example, in TLS 1.3, um, all key exchange methods are forward, uh, support forward secrecy. And the, 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 key, the RSA key exchange uh, has, has been removed altogether. So I, you know, our, our lives are in the future are going to be much, much easier uh, for that and many, many other reasons. So the, other, the next thing that you have to think about is certificates. So basically, one, uh, a certificate is a digital ID. And you know, um, all it needs to do is really enable a, your user who has never accessed your website to come to your website simply by typing a domain name and to establish a secure connection to your website. And by secure connection, I really mean that a man in the middle can't, can't just hijack that and gain full visibility into the traffic. So there's, technically speaking, there's no trust. Lots of people use the word trust when it comes to SSL and TLS. So trust is a very overloaded term. What that means in TLS and, and, and PKI, the way we're using it today, is that simply that you are talking to a server that's been designated to respond to, the, to a particular website. That's all there is. There's no trust as such. For example, um, you could go to uh, the, a, a con man could set up a website and get an SSL certificate just easy, as easily as everyone else. You go there, you can see the padlock and everything you say, you, you, your exchange is secure, but it's only secure from a man in the middle attacker. You're not secure from the con man itself. So I, I'd like to keep trust uh, separate. So if you have that certificate, what's going to happen is that we have these certification authorities. There's hundreds of, of them around the world. And you go and prove ownership of your domain name, and they give you a certificate. And that sort of makes this easy, because now billions of people can come to your website, and sort of uh, and the security is, is there for them. What's really important is that your certificates have all the domain names that you want and you're using for your websites. They also have to be listed in the certificates. If you don't do this, uh, basically the problem is you, you don't really control how people arrive to your website. For example, it used to be quite common that um, people make, uh, take out a certificate for www.example.com, but they forgot to take example.com. And now on mobile platforms, people are, you know, want to type as fewer characters as, as they, they, they need, and they just type example.com, and suddenly people get a certificate warning, uh, which is basically saying, oh, this website is insecure, do you really want to, want to proceed? And I think in larger organizations, uh, marketing departments also in, uh, invent domain names for whatever reason, to, for marketing, and then they, without telling anyone, and suddenly that points to your, uh, your services uh, too. So I have a very simple rule of thumb. If it's in, in, in the DNS, and if it's pointing to your server, it should also be in, in your certificate. And if you do this, it's, it's quite straightforward. Uh, you will have eliminated uh, this, the certificate warnings. So we have this other type of uh, certificate. Um, basically, you have to figure out how to do validation. And what that means is that by default you get what's called a domain validation. And in domain validation, you simply prove ownership of uh, the, a domain name. And uh, it, one of the exercises that we'll do later is uh, we, you will, we'll give you, we'll, we have given you this service for you to use. And they actually, we've registered five different domain names for them. And they have different host names. And you will get your certificate simply by saying, look, I have control of this server. And, what, and I, I need a certificate. So what the certification authority will do, they will actually, actually reach out to the server and they'll tell you, uh, here's a number, please put this number on, on the server. And you'll put this number on the server, they'll look at it from the outside and say, okay, that's right, you have control of this server, we'll give you a certificate. So that's, so that's domain, name, domain validation because it's, it can be automated, it's straightforward, it's cheap, and everybody is doing it. Um, we do have a special type of certificates. They're called extended validation certificates. And there's a, there's a sort of a long procedure that, you, that certification authorities have to go through. 
uh, to gi give you this certificate. And it essentially involves identifying the legal entity that's behind the domain name. And you also have to prove that within the legal entity you have the, uh, the right to get the certificate and so on and so forth. These certificates have this uh, green glow in browsers and usually it will tell you, the, the cert will tell you also the name of the legal entity. You can maybe click there, you can see the, uh, the, the address and so on and so forth. So this gets you closer to trust the way people usually perceive it. But still, again, that's, you know, in the UK you can get, you can form a limited company for 20 pounds and you can get an EMI certificate for it. So, you know, there, there isn't any real trust behind it, but certainly it can help uh, uh, a great deal, uh, somewhat. So, at the moment, EV certificates don't really have a great um, security, uh, um, they're, not so, sort of, they're not more secure. Uh, we, in the PKI uh, today, we have a bit of a problem. Revocation checking doesn't work. Normally, when you get a certificate, it's usually issued for a period of one year. Uh, you can get one for up to three years. The thing is, three years is a very long time. If, if someone steals your private key, then they can impersonate you for another, say, three years. But let's say for the sake of argument, impersonate you for another, another full year. So imagine that you, run, you, you have a bank and then you're, someone steals your uh, a private key. Now they can go, and you're, you know, you're sort of a popular bank, they can go to any Wi-Fi wi -Fi point in the city. They can just uh, stand up a man in the middle uh, a proxy, which is very easy to, you just download, it, you know, it, 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 it's a tool that's already written, you just download it, they just feed the private key they've stolen to this man-in-the-middle proxy, and suddenly any customers of your bank who are on that Wi-Fi network actually see the attacker as, as you, and they happily log in, and they give away their credentials, and now the attacker can actually log into their bank accounts, and they can do this for an entire year. And this is the reason why we have a location checking browsers are really supposed to um, check every time they, they're accessing a website, uh, go back to the issuing certification authority and say, oh, look, can you please tell me if this certificate is still valid? And that's the ideal. Unfortunately, in the quest for, for performance, uh, browsers uh, have stopped doing this. So today, the only way to reliably revoke a certificate is if you have a very high value certificate that will, and th then browser vendors have the special proprietary mechanisms, which are basically lists of compromised certificates, but in order to keep this list small, they only add sort of intermediary certificates, um, you know, if uh, banking certificates maybe, but if, if you have a small website, there's no way that you will ever get a certificate revoked. So this is another reason why you really want to, um, to have short length certificate uh, times. Now, why I've been talking about it is because it's quite likely that in the future we extended validation certificates will become more secure because people, uh, CAs, will start to issue them uh, uh, under condition that uh, their revocation must be checked every time. And then in that case, if uh, you indeed get compromised, uh, that the, the, the attacker, and you actually discover and report the problem, the certificate gets revoked and the attacker won't be able to use uh, that, that certificate against you. So that's sort of in the future. When that's going to happen, we don't know. Uh, the, the specific, more specifically, the feature that I'm talking about is called must staple. And it's in Firefox, I think, as of this month. Uh, of course, they're not going to enable it straight away, but it's going to say, take some time for the industry uh, to play with this feature so we are sort of confident it's working and we'll see how things are, are going to develop from, from now on. So I sort of skipped a bit. I talked about uh, certificate host names. Uh, so that was my earlier slide. So I'm going to move on to certificate sharing. This is also very important. So what I was mentioning earlier, if you share the same certificate uh, among a, a group of servers, you have to share the same underlying private keys. And you really don't want that because that's, that's the root. So in the ideal situation, you want every under, uh, you know, sort of logically separate system to have a, di a, a different certificate. So there's not, no, there, there isn't anything wrong with wildcard certificates, for example, and often they're very useful. But if a wildcard certificate within your organization maps to one group of people, one team, that's absolutely fine. If you're crossing those boundaries and then you're letting different teams use wildcard certificates, or share certificates anyhow, that's, that's not as good. Uh, especially because at the application security level, now, now we're not talking en encryption at all, it's actually possible 
to exploit one application level vulnerability on one server and transfer it to another server if they both share uh, the same certificate. And there was this famous case a couple of years ago with Mozilla. They used to run these de two different websites and there was one guy who just transferred a cross-site scripting vulnerability from a low security site to their high, higher security site. And this higher security site was, was their add-ons website. Uh, so this is another reason, and uh, you will get, uh, I mean, you will hear a lot this, uh, from me about keeping everything separate. Like just uh, last week, we had a new vulnerability uh, called Drown. It's about, it's a vulnerability in the ancient SSL2, but the researchers managed to find a way to abuse a server with SSL2 and then attack TLS. And why? Because it's the same Certificate, either the same certificate or either the same RSA key that's been used. So whenever you have things that overlap, it's a potential liability. So ideally, you'd like to keep everything. You should really keep everything uh, separate. And the other, the last thing is uh, certificate lifetime, which I also uh, talked about. So the shorter the lifetime, the better for you, because um, I mean it's a less of a liability. Uh, because you can revoke a certificate, it will expire by itself. Can I, can I go back to that point about you know, keeping things separate? And I'd like to uh, ask again about this, this idea of having separate certificates on every server. Because okay. you see, your, your, your answer there was, but you need to have a, um, you, you're going to have the same domain name, you're going to have, the, you're going to, have to cover the same. Um, domain in a, in a cluster of servers, okay. but these individual servers all have different host names as well. Okay. So you could put the, these host names in the subject old name, okay. um, and, then, and then the certificate would be unequivocally bound to that server. Well, you, you could get... In the, in, in the cluster, um, and you have a, a better partition. Uh, you could have, you could do that, but you, you would have, say, five servers, five different private keys, and then five different certificates. Right. I mean, it's entirely possible. What I'm saying is, it's always a balance between usability and security. I'm telling it, in mo I'm saying in most organizations, you're going to create more problems that you're going to solve. Because I, I think, logistically speaking, unless you automate everything, it's, it's going to be really cumbersome to get system administrators to renew these certificates individually. But you do that all together, I guess, because the what? whole cluster would be... No, no, there are five different certificates. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But, but so, the, the, the timing would be the same. The time, of course, of course, it, it wouldn't make any sense. No, I, I just think it's, it's too much work. I don't see the sort of, what's the tangible benefit there? I think cryptogra cryptographically speaking, yes. It's better to have five different key materials than, than one. But you know, even like take the SSL, this uh, SSL2 vulnerability, it can abuse, be abused even if the, the name in the, in the certificate is the same. So in your case, you, uh, your setup with five different keys wouldn't have prevented uh, the attack because ultimately it's the same system and if the name in the certificate is the same, the certificates can, can be abused uh, against the, the server. I think what you're saying, what, what you're asking and talking about is sort of goes in the realm of, uh, realm of extremely secure s systems where you want to get absolutely, you know, all the security you can get. But um, I think for most systems that, you know, it's, it's not really worth doing that sort of, doesn't have to work. Okay, and um, one, um, one last slide really about certificates. This slide is not as, as important these days as it was maybe about a year ago. Um, the, the, the security of a certificate depends on two, uh, two uh, critical aspects. So all, every certificate is signed by a certification authority and for a signature they use their own private key and they will, they will typically use a hashing <coughs> function. And for a signature to be secure, both the private key and the hashing function have to be secure. And now we have the situation there where uh, the, the dominant hashing function used to be SHA-1. Uh, and uh, we are getting to very, very close to the SHA-1 being as effectively entirely insecure. Actually, you, 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 you will have heard yesterday here that it's expected that SHA-1 will be completely broken this year. 
And so at some point, I think about a year, two years, about two years ago, uh, the industry started to, uh, to require a change. And then we said, okay, we have to uh, rotate all certificates that we have. And by the end of 2016, we must turn SHA-1 off. And that's the current plan. Uh, we, we didn't know, maybe, maybe things will happen faster. But the current plan is all certificates that use SHA-1 will stop working in January, January 2017. And um, I have a, a slide. So one of the projects uh, I do uh, is called SSL Pulse. SSL Pulse for four years now has been tracking the, most, the biggest websites. And I, I, I track uh, uh, signature usage. And you can see now that you know, where you see orange right now, that used to be all green. And now in the last year, I mean, that, that number has been decreasing. Um, and now we, we got into maybe about only about 13 uh, percent of service still continue to, to use SHA-1. This is it's very, very important. I think that we are sort of managing barely to phase out SHA-1 this time because what happened uh, pre before SHA-1, we used to have another function called MD5 and that, that's still popular. But, and um, MD5, uh, there were signs of it, it, it being, its breakage over a year, very slowly over years and pretty much everybody ignored it. And then at some point, a bunch of researchers got together in 2008 and basically said, this is ridiculous, no one's, no one's taking us seriously. So you know what, we are going to break MD5, we are going to use, we are going to use it in a real, real, real life attack. So what they did, they, got, uh, they, they obtained a cluster of uh, playstations um, and then devised a, a method of attack and they used that against a real certification authority. They managed to create a collision uh, a so-called chosen prefix collision in MD5 and eventually they managed to obtain a fully working uh, certification <coughs> authority uh, uh, certificate and effectively they were able to create a, a certificate for any website in the world and uh, without uh, anyone uh, finding them out. Of course they didn't want to do that and in fact they generated this rogue certificate that they, they, they intentionally uh, made it expire so they put a date in the past, so I mean, no one could actually abuse it in real life, but they made, they made a point. And basically, uh, everybody turned off MD5 in a week. With SHA-1 is a bit difficult, uh, different and more difficult because uh, the next step up is the, the SHA-2 family or SHA-256, uh, which most people are using. And what's difficult is that not all devices don't really support SHA-2. So lots of people are struggling right now because oh, they want to use SHA-2, um, but you know, there are some very old devices like point of sales terminals. They don't and they can't be upgraded and now they're in a bit of a, in a, bit of a pickle. Um, so if you follow news, just recently we have uh, WorldPay, they have requested an extension so that they are allowed to issue some SHA-1 certificates because their point of, uh, uh, point of sale terminals are actually sto stopping working <coughs> because they're not able to connect securely uh, to, to, to the services. And the final thing about certificates is that just having a correct certificate in your server is not sufficient. Uh, these days, we don't use certificates, we use certificate chains. And so what I see, what you can see in the slide here is that uh, the, the common case today is the, the entire chain consists of three certificates. You have the leaf, which is your main certificate. There's one intermediary and there's the root. And in order to deploy a service correctly, in this case, you need to have two certificates in your configuration, the leaf and the intermediary. And the root, the root is really not needed in your configuration because roots are something that uh, systems need to have themselves. So in all your operating systems, in all your browsers, there's a root store. And the root store is more or less just a collection of, of sort of a CA certificates that your systems trust. And then, um, there's no point in configuring this certificate in your service because even if it's going to, even if it's there, uh, no one's going to trust it. And this used to be a big problem uh, because I keep track of these things. 10% uh, of all sites used to be misconfigured. And when, when the chain is not complete, you get a certi certificate warning and the situation is exactly the same as if you don't have a, a valid certificate. Um, so this is, uh, this is uh, part of uh, what you need to uh, uh, you know, take care about. So the good thing is, um, when I started to research this area 
uh, it used to be quite difficult and um, it, th there wasn't an easy way uh, to uh, find out if your city server is properly configured and over the period of years I created a website called SSL Labs and we will use it as part of the, the um, uh, exercises later. These days if your web server is publicly accessible all you need to do is type in the host name in SSL Labs in, which is a free service and it will go there and perform hundreds of these tests and it will tell you exactly what's wrong and then at least if you, if you, if you made a mistake now you know that you, you did and now you can, you, you can fix it and certificate uh, warnings about uh, the, the, the certificate chain that's one of the things that uh, uh, you get to uh, have a warning about so question are there some browsers that uh, have the capability to uh, download an intermediate some browsers do so this yeah, sometimes it doesn't give you a warning yes there are two reasons so in uh, certificate. So if you take a look at the chain, um, ideally, I think in 99, let's say 99% of all certificates, inside one of the fields, by the way, certificates are just files. There's nothing really particularly special about certificates. It just, there's some files with some fields, right? There's some binary data, there's some textual data, and so on and so forth. One of the fields is a pointer, it's actually a URL to the previous certificate in the chain. Um, and then it's actually to the parent certificate. So, in theory, uh, if you just get a leaf certificate and you look into that field and then you go on the, to the internet, you download the next certificate and you download the next, you can form the entire chain. Now, in practice, what's happening is that uh, our Windows can do that and as far as I know, no other platform, platform does. Um, however, what other, pl other platforms do, they uh, <coughs> cache intermediary certificates that they see. So for example, <coughs> Firefox um, and Safari will, the first time they see an intermediate, uh, record it and put it in the store. If they encounter a server that doesn't have a complete change some, at some later date, they will reuse the cache certificate. Which is why this type of problem is very difficult to troubleshoot. Typically you have uh, web developers who are developing a website their browsers will be primed in one way or another. By the way, IE will also, Windows will also cache intermediary certificates. So it will download them and cache them. So for you and for everyone in your organization, your website just works perfectly because you have the certificates, but then you will get reports about your site not, not working in some cases, and then you will have no idea, no idea why. So, um, that's, that's all I have about keys and certificates uh, so far. Any questions? I'm, I'm sorry because our time here is very limited. I'm sort of rushing to quite a few things. Um, for, uh, I don't know. For example, if you want to know why exactly is RSA key exchange uh, uh, bad and why you don't get it for forward secrecy is something you can, we can talk about later. I think that's quite interesting to, to see you know, how um, you know, a particular flawed design or a key exchange can actually have, have impact later on, on, on security. So if, if you have uh, no questions, I can, I, I'm going to move to something that's sort of more tangible and certainly the, the first part is, more, uh, is certainly easier. It's about choosing the right protocols and then choosing the right cipher switch to support in your servers. When it comes to the protocols, it's quite easy. We only have, I think, five. And uh, anything that has SSL in the name, that's not good and you shouldn't be using it. Especially SSL2. SSL2 is a 1994, it, it came out in 1994. Um, and I think it had to be replaced as soon as 1995. It was that bad. Um, the rumor is that Netscape actually didn't have any cryptographers uh, when they, they were designing SSL2. Um, I think th also another rumor is that for SSL3, they, they did have a cryptographer, but they gave him two weeks to look into it. And it's, it's amazing that SSL3 actually survived uh, the, 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 as long as it did. In any case, uh, SSL2 and SSL3 are vulnerable, and you, should, you shouldn't uh, really use them. Uh, today, I think some people who run legacy environments might still require SSL3, uh, like I mentioned, point of sale, term, uh, sale terminals, uh, those type of in, uh, environments where it's difficult to replace hardware, uh, it's difficult to reach uh, customers, those environments might struggle. Strictly speaking, SSL3 is vulnerable only when used against, uh, with HTTP. 
because the types of attack that we know um, it require that uh, a man in the middle also get, get you know, they are also in the, in the victim's browser and they perform certain attacks that sort of manipulate the browser and also they have a man in the middle position on the network which is uh, very difficult to do unless you actually have a browser there if you're, if you're attacking something else where the, for example that, that doesn't have uh, JavaScript doesn't have any I mean you're not able to influence what it does it's, it's sort of difficult to attack SSO3 but you know it's so inferior and you don't need it so uh, I, would, I would recommend that you never never deploy it now after that we have TLS1 which is sort of it's vulnerable uh, the biggest problem it has is the so-called beast vulnerability and the, uh, we, we don't like it but again we have the problem that so many old devices don't support it uh, the good thing about beast is it's been mitigated in modern browsers so it's not really a feasible attack vector today so TLS is one of these things that we have to keep and PCI recently said um, that you have to get rid of TLS1 by the end of June 2000 and 18. So that gives us about two years and a few months uh, to slowly migrate away and stop using TLS. Uh, TLS1, t sorry, TLS1. TLS1.1 doesn't matter. Um, that's because everybody jumped over it. Uh, TLS1.2 came in 2008. Modern browsers added support for TLS1.2 in 2013. So it took five years and just, they just jumped over TLS1.1, which is why this version is really not important today. TLS 1.2 is the only version that we know to be properly secure and only if you configure it securely so that's very good um, fundamentally what we are doing now with TLS 1.3 we're designing a secure protocol that's going to work for us in the next maybe 10 or 20 years but today TLS 1.2 is, is, is pretty pretty secure here's a, just a little illustration of what's going on right now um, we have almost 100% support for TLS 1.0 and uh, support for TLS 1.1 and 1.2 is very very slowly uh, rising so maybe in two years time this will actually be uh, close to uh, co close to 100% after 20 years we still have a large chunk of, um, slightly less than 10% of servers still support SSL 2 I'm hoping this was measured before drown I'm hoping it next month we will see a further decline in SSL2 and hopefully further decline in SSL3 because these, these, these protocols are <coughs> inherently insecure and we really, really have to uh, get rid of them. So before, normally what I do at this point, I talk about forward secrecy, but I already covered that. And the reason why I talk about forward secrecy is because that's probably the most important decision that you're going to make uh, in, when it comes to your server configuration. Uh, simply because with the rise of the internet we've seen also the rise of automated attacks and we have agencies that simply collect all this data and, uh, and then later then sort of figure out what to do with it uh, one famous case if you know is um, uh, the Lavabit web mail provider Edward Snowden used Lavabit to, and that's where, we, where he had uh, an account and after um, uh, it was discovered that he used Lavabit uh, it so happens that they didn't have forward secrecy configured on their servers and then what happened later is the FBI um, requested the, from Lavabit that they turn over the private keys to them and uh, there was a court order and, and they eventually they did we don't really know why they did it so uh, we can only speculate uh, then the reason they, they wanted that private key is because they had some or uh, some they had recorded some of that network traffic and they needed the private key to really decrypt it and see what's, what's inside. I think this slide perfectly illustrates the difficulty, what real life difficulties there are when it comes to configuring SSL and TLS. I think today we understand patching. And if you tell someone that they need to patch, they sort of, they're probably already, they're probably already doing it. And that's quite straightforward. You go to your vendor, you get the patches and you patch. For, to, for forward secrecy, what you actually need to do, you need to reconfigure your servers. It's easy to do, there are no consequences, chances are your servers are going to run faster, but we have millions of websites, so millions of these in, uh, sites individually have to, make, have to realize that forward secrecy is important to them. They have to take steps, to, um, they have to decide to do it, they have to find someone who knows how to do it, they actually have to do it. 
And this is the result. You can see the situation is, you know, it's, it's, it's all over the place. I think only about a half, less than half here, support forward secrecy in some capacity. And clearly, uh, more, than, more than one half don't support it at all. So all these people who don't have forward secrecy, their private keys are liability and you know, could be, could be uh, used against them. Like, for example, zero days are sort of relatively common in one way or another. So if I really want to attack your website, all, <coughs> I, all I need to do is find a zero day, wait for a zero day. You're not going to be able to patch it the instant it, it goes live. And I'm going to go in for, for a minute. I'm going to get your private keys. I'm going to get out. And that's all. That, that, that's, that's all it takes. So um, the second technically uh, very, very important aspect of uh, TLS configuration. So you, we've done the protocols, and now is the cipher suites. If you go to study TLS, what you'll find that TLS in itself is not a protocol. It's a framework <coughs> for protocols, especially if you talk, for, for, to, talk to cryptographers. They're, they're going to tell you that you know, a protocol is a speci very specific com combination of different cryptographic uh, primitives. And then you decide that you want to use them and how you're going to combine them. And that's actually a protocol. So TLS is a shell, and it's, it's a nice shell that's, that supports all these small pieces. And then you combine the pieces into cipher suites. And then when you're configuring your web service, you're saying, OK, I want to support these cipher suites. And here are some components uh, that you, you can see them here that uh, you might want to use. For example, for key exchange, you want to use what's called uh, a, a, an elliptic curve Diffie-Hammond exchange. And this, is, this type of key exchange is very fast and supports forward secrecy. There's an older, uh, sort of, it's not, there's an older key exchange mecha mechanism called Diffie-Hellman key exchange, uh, which is also equally secure, but it's much slower, which is why everybody today prefers the elliptic curve one. Then for the configuration, today the only practical choice is to use the AES cipher for encryption, uh, largely because it's so well, un well understood and it's very, very performant. And I'll talk about performance later on. And then you also have to use a special type of encryption called authentic encryption. Out of about 300 cipher suites that are supported in TLS, only a small number support, support authentic encryption. Um, if you're not using uh, authentic encryption in TLS 1.2, you have two other choices. One is called stream encryption and block encryption. Both of these are known to be uh, insecure. Well, stream encryption is not insecure as such. It's great. However, in TLS, we only have one stream cipher, and that's RC4. And RC4 is insecure. So you can't really use stream encryption because it's bad. Um, block encryption, uh, the, the way TLS uses it is actually inherently flawed. And today, we don't think that any of the libraries are, are actually vulnerable to attacks uh, in this area. However, there have been cases of where, well, where vulnerabilities existed. So the only uh, recommendation that makes sense is to focus on authenticated cipher suites. And they're only supported in TLS, TLS 1.2. Some things that um, you sort of could use, in, on, but only if you're desperate, uh, are the triple dash cipher suite. The only reason why you would use this one is if you wanted to support i6 on Windows XP. So it really depends on your target, target, uh, uh, on target market. And the RSA key exchange, which is sort of the same reason, if you have some really old devices that you absolutely must support, and then you would use the RSA key exchange. But then the whole thing about forward secrecy, you have to really be careful about it. Um, lots of people might think they want to use RC4. Uh, RC4 is not practically broken. I mean, we don't have any practical tax on it. But it's so old and so bad. And, that we have so much, uh, so, so, so much better crypto primitives today that it, it's, it's, it would be terrible to use RC4. Uh, there have been some measurements done, and virtually no one really needs RC4, so it needs, needs to die. The reason why RC4 is popular is because it's virtually the first cipher to be available with TLS, and it used to be supported by everything. Uh, and now it's sort of that's slowly going away. In fact, in SSL Pulse, where we measure RC4 support, there's a small number of sites that used to be thousands. And I think today it's about 67 sites that remain in our data set that use only RC4 cipher suites. 
And these servers, they no longer work. The reason why this number has gotten to be so low is that modern browsers don't support IC4 anymore, and that just happened in January uh, this year. So this is sort of the overview, overview of the theory. So what, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go uh, and look at, the pr practically speaking, what that means. I'm going to be using OpenSSL ciphers with names. Unfortunately, OpenSSL uses their own names, so these are not exactly the same as in the TLS standard. And the reason why I'm using OpenSSL names here is because that's, those are names that you will be needing in the practical work. So I think it make, makes things slightly, slightly easier. So what I'm doing here, I'm presenting a slide where uh, this is a conceptual configuration that you should be deploying. I mean, the real production configuration is, is going to have more suites, uh, but conceptually, there is not going to be di dif different from this. So what you do at the top is your uh, best cipher suite, everybody's best cipher suite, which uses a fast elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman key exchange. It uses RSA keys. Um, you could substitute uh, and change, uh, you, you, could, you could equally well use ECDSA keys and that's absolutely fine. Then it uses AES at 128 bits for encryption. Uh, the GCM words there means that this is a special mode that uses authenticated encryption, and that's, that's good. Whenever you see GSM, that's good. And the final bit, uh, SHA-256, you can safely ignore. Whenever you see GSM, uh, this is, uh, I can explain this later if you're interested. Um, for authenticated suites, the last segment in the name doesn't, is not that relevant. It, it will be relevant to a cryptographer, but to you, there's no impact and there's no practical difference if, if you see one thing or another. So that cipher suite is really widely supported, and that's probably going to be ne negotiated with most of your user base. So what I'm going to do uh, here, so at the top you have your most preferred cipher suite, and then you follow up with some, some other suites that are sort of that are secure, but you know, not the best option. For example, the <coughs> second I have on the list is, a Diffie, is the same as the first one, uh, just uses a Diffie-Hellman, the classic Diffie-Hellman key exchange. In terms of security, this is probably as good, but it's going to be much, much slower. So what you're, what you're doing there, because there's more than two billion devices out there, you don't know exactly what all of those devices will be capable of. So what you're doing with Cypher Suites, you're making sure that you only have what's secure, but you have a choice. You, 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 you offer them a selection, and basically you try to negotiate your best Cypher Suite for every client that comes along. And the, which is why it's critical uh, that when you configure your web server, you also tell it to enforce its own preferences. In many software applications, still the case where they leave it to the client. And if the client says, if the client offers the worst cipher suite first, some ser servers will happily say, okay, we'll use that one. So this is why it's imperative that you, say, you, you configure mm -hmm. server-side preference. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so, on, so on and so forth, we, we continue with other cipher suites. One thing that I've put here also, uh, a recent trend is that new protocols are being designed with security in mind. So when they worked on HTTP2, they said, yes, it's fine, you can use encryption with HTTP2, however, not all encryption is allowed. We're going to allow only se secure encryption with HTTP2. Unfortunately, we have sort of a uh, transition period right now where libraries don't really um, know about uh, the requirement for secure encryption when it comes to HTTP2. So today, if you misconfigure your web server and you try to use HTTP2 but don't, don't use, so let's say that you use this suite here, suite, uh, here uh, the connection would fail. And because the, the HTTP libraries will, will see that you're offering to speak some ancient suite with them, and they will just break off the connection. I, I think today you wouldn't even get, get an error message, so it, it's pretty bad. SSL apps will warn you about it. But for this reason, all the HTTP2 suites are at the top, so if you have modern clients, chances are, well, it's guaranteed actually, that they will also get one of the, the supported cipher suites, and then everything will work just fine. So from the conceptual configuration, I'm going to expand the number of suites that I have in my configuration simply by including a wider choice. All these suites are equally secure. Uh, however, in this case, they're probably slower. So um, what, I'm going, what I'm doing here, uh, if you see the, the differences between the first and the second cipher suite, 
The second uses uh, 256 bits of encryption, which you probably don't need. But this is a very small number of clients that support only that. And if you didn't support it yourself, then the connection would fail. And then I'm adding just a, a, a other, other bits and pieces, like I think my, uh, my pointer will work here. So if you, if you uh, t t take a look at the SHA-256 bit at the end, this is sort of a legacy mechanism for integrity in TLS. Uh, SHA-256 integrity is two times slower than, than SHA uh, integrity. In reality, they use something that's called an HMAC. And there's no known problems, even with a weaker uh, uh, hashing func function such as SHA, there, there are no practical attacks right now against TLS in this regard. So there's no real reason to uh, use a, a suite that's uh, twice, uh, sorry, a hashing function is twice as slow. But in, by the way, it doesn't really matter at all because with all modern clients, you're going to use authentic encryption anyway. So this is, this everything here really applies to some um, older clients that you want to support out of necessity. But with modern clients, you're only going to use what's known to be safe. And I have a list, list of suites that you really shouldn't use. The only reason why I, I you know, have them here, I want to highlight that these are bad. And anytime you see them in, in your configuration, you should really remove them. Um, some really big organizations might, might need them, but they uh, need them only because they don't have time or uh, power to replace the, the, some very old systems. You know, in many companies, someone has installed a system like 20 years ago, and all the people originally who were originally there left, and they don't know what to do with it. Um, and this is sort of a situation. But these cipher suites are all insecure, and you shouldn't use them for one, um, one reason or another. And finally, just to um, um, be complete, uh, there's some new cipher suites coming. Um, for example, there's one called Chacha Poly 1305. Um, it's been in use by, uh, by Google for a very, very long time. And uh, the next version of OpenSSL is going to support it. Um, Firefox supports it. Uh, Chrome supports it. And it's very fast. It's uh, uh, very secure. It uses authenticated encryption. And what's particularly interested, interesting, it's quite fast on mobile devices. Now, I mentioned AES earlier and said AES is practically the only choice because it's so fast. The reason it's so fast is that today's desktops and laptops actually have hardware acceleration for AES, and that makes AES very fast. It's even faster than RC4, and everybody used to love RC4 because of its speed. However, mobile devices uh, such as phones, they don't have any hardware acceleration for AES, and that sort of makes them slower, and one of the design goals behind the Chacha uh, Cypher Suite was speed in mobile devices. So what's going to become interesting in the following months, Google are already doing this, if they get a mobile device, they give them a Chacha Suite, and if they get a, a laptop or a desktop, they give them an AES thing. So this is, sort of, this is going to be configurable in, in the future, it's not right now, uh, but maybe in the next six months, six or 12 months. I think this is a good time for a break. I mean, very short break by, uh, if you have any questions for me right now about Cypher Suite configuration. The thing is, uh, from your perspective, unless you're really interested in understanding exactly why things are ordered in a certain way, what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you a list of Cypher Suites that you just configure and you plug in, and that's that. You don't, I mean, the, the, it, it's as simple as that. Um, especially because my approach to uh, configuring web servers today is to list these cipher suites one after another. I mean, if you, if you go and if you, if you look for open SSL um, sort of uh, uh, tutorials and articles, you will often come across these really unusual keyword combinations, which is uh, the way open SSL can configure cipher suites, which are really, no pun intended, cryptic. And they're actually quite sometimes quite difficult to understand what, you, what you're actually doing. I spent a lot of my time trying to, the idea be behind that approach to configuring Cypher Switch is you basically, basically say, oh, I like elliptic curve um, Diffie-Hellman, oh, and I like AES, so I, for as long as I say to tell OpenSSL that I like these two, it's going to be able to figure out what, I, what they want. Uh, in reality, that's not the case. What ha started to happen is 
year after year, we start to discover new problems with TLS. And in order to mitigate, mitigate those problems, you had to design your software suites in specifically just the right order. And it became impossible to actually use the keyword-based configuration. If you are up for a challenge, in my book, I actually uh, have a section that where I do attempt to do it that way. But what I do, I, what, what I, and then I tell you, this is for only for your education. What you, you should really be uh, doing is just having a list of these. And if you have a list of cipher suites that appear like this in your web configuration, there will be no doubt to exactly what you're enabling. And, and, and everybody who see, sees your list will know exactly what's going on. Whereas before, uh, you would have to find the right version of OpenSSL. Basically, the only way to, to figure out what, ex what would happen exactly is to log in into the same server where you have the same version of OpenSSL that's running on the, in, the produ in production and then test your configuration. And even that, then, I mean, there were some edge cases where it wouldn't work. Uh, because, for example, your Apache web server doesn't have everything enabled in the same way that you do from the command line. Um, and with this, it's just uh, straightforward. Um, the subsuites that don't have GCM mode, do they use CBC? Yes, yes, they do. So CBC is, uh, is a block mode uh, in, in TLS. The reason, um, so this being deprecated in TLS 1.3, only authenticated modes will, will remain, and that's fantastic. In CBC, there's, um, the idea with authenticated modes of encryption is that they support encryption and integrity validation at the same time. So in TLS 1.3, uh, it's a black box. It's a black box, you say, I want to transport this amount of data safely. You, you input it into the box, and out comes the encrypted version. On the way back, you feed this encrypted version into the black box, out comes plain text. Um, essentially, when you get the plain text out, you also, you also guarantee that no one modified this plain text in transit. Uh, TLS, before TLS uh, 1.2, there were no authenticated modes of encryption, and then TLS had to solve this in, at the protocol level. And the way it, it, that they sold it, they, was, they used a wrong approach where you first decrypt it and then you check for integrity. And this opens a very small window of opportunity that attacker could exploit. And there's a series of attacks called uh, Lucky 13. Um, they, they're covered in, in detail in my book. And no matter how, so th this type of attack has to be mitigated in the library, to, li all the libraries today. And even uh, uh, that is uh, uh, incredibly difficult to do. And we are seeing, so, so newer libraries, so for example, OpenSSL probably has the best mitigation methods. But if you look at some newer libraries, it's more often than not, is, is found that they are vulnerable. And uh, so to the security community decided that it's not possible to implement CBC mode securely, and which is why it has been abandoned. And in TLS 1.3, you just get authentic encryption. Okay, I, need, I think I need to uh, hurry up a bit so we can talk about something uh, more interesting. Um, I just want to mention that another difficulty that you're facing with TLS is that there isn't any one place where you configure uh, security. Um, so part of your security comes from your private key, from, then from the certificate that's generated by certification authority. Then you choose the protocols, that's in the web server configuration, you choose the cipher switch as well. Uh, however, when you choose the cipher suites, there's one aspect that's not decided by the cipher, mm -hmm. cipher suites. So even if you're configuring um, key exchange here, ECDH, that uh, it actually refers to a particular type of key exchange that you will use, it's strength. It's not in the cipher suite definition, it's in the web server configuration. So I have one slide. Um, basically, when you're using elliptic, the elliptic curve, curve uh, Diffie-Hellman, you have to select a named curve, um, which is sort of the context in which uh, encryption happens. And the, the, the context, the strength of the con context is really equals to the strength of the key exchange. And um, the good thing is you probably won't have to change anything because this uh, so-called NIST P256 is the named curve that's today the only feasible option and the default option in virtual all software. But that's not the case for the older Diffie-Hellman key exchange, where by default, we for a very long time used to have only 1024 bits strength. 
and until we saw some attacks, and there, there are some research papers from Logjam, if you, if you follow the news. These days, most applications will support um, stronger, which is 2048 bits. However, if you follow the access <coughs> later on, you will see that the default configuration of Nginx actually supports 1024-bit uh, digital harmony key exchange, and one of the exercises will be to change the default Nginx configuration so that it's not weak in this respect. Um, and then, less interestingly, the new curves that are being designed, then you will be able to use in TLS, but it's going to be some years before they universally support it. Um, because in, you know, for, in order for us to, be, to use these curves, they have to be supported in clients and in service. And right now, uh, SEC 256R1 uh, is universally supported, and there's another one called uh, 384R1, and that, that's basically it. The, those, those two are the only uh, ones that are supported by browsers. Um, performance, uh, just to give some indication, is to uh, you know, the exact uh, types of keys that you select, and the strength of the keys have uh, direct impact on your performance. So you always, your goal is to use the minimum key size that will achieve your security goals. If you, so if you look at maybe uh, the standard for RSA is 2048 bits right now, and uh, what these bars show is uh, the amount of time a client will spend in a, in a handshake. Just look at this as a relative number, it doesn't really matter what the number actually is. And the amount of CPU time a, a server will spend while negotiating a handshake. So if you see, when I say diff the diff helmet key exchange is slow, and this is this, these two bars uh, cover diff helmet key exchange, they're probably at least five to six times slower than anything else. So which is why no one really wants to, to uh, use it. But you know, this is, this is something that's very secure, uh, 2048 bits of RSA, with an elliptic curve diff helmet key exchange of 256 bits, and it's actually quite fast, even faster. So when I said that ECDSA keys are slightly f uh, they're faster, they're not really meaningfully faster. If you're at Google, and if you're designing a CDN that millions of and billions will use, uh, perhaps it's important that you use ECDSA. But you know, for normal sites, the, the difference from here to here is not really, is not really that big. Um, and um, so basically, it's in your uh, configurations, you choose from one of these two. All these are legacy configurations that you, you, you should never bother with. I also have one for cipher suites, and I said triple desk is slow, and this is, this is how slow it is. So what you really need to use is uh, the, the, si the, the one that's at the bottom. This is our preferred suite, if you recall the configuration. Our preferred uh, suite is the fastest. Um, with one disclaimer, uh, the measurements have been done on, on servers that have hardware accelerated AES. So because I, I, did, I used that environment because if you care about performance, that's the environment that you're going to have. Um, so you can see that RC4, which used to be very fast, is now AES is still faster because of that hardware acceleration. And in the following months, as soon as AES, OpenSSL releases ChaCha, I'm going to redo these uh, tests and we're, we're going to see exactly um, uh, how ChaCha compares to uh, these cyber threats. <coughs> And um, that's all about uh, the technical aspects of configuring TLS. What I have from here on is about HTTP-specific advice, which is quite interesting, but perhaps we can, I can take some questions. If there are any issues and things that you're not unclear about. I saw some rumors that this curve was straight towards. Yes. So it, it depends on how paranoid, uh, paranoid you are. So there is a, there's a bit of a controversy about the NIST curves. <coughs> and the reason is that uh, NIST is the body that sets cryptographic standards for US agencies, for the, for the US government. And what happened with the NIST curves, uh, basically the NSA designed them. They designed them and gave them to NIST to adopt as they are. And uh, in the design, um, the NSA selected some numbers, uh, but we don't know why they selected ex the exact those numbers. So the trend in cryptogra cryptography today is that if you have to use some special numbers, uh, you find so some sort of reasoning to prove that you haven't backdoored them. For example, in elliptic curve cryptography, 
uh, if you use incorrect numbers, you're going to generate weak curves. So a lot of effort is spent actually on designing these curves, choosing those numbers to, so that when you end, whatever encryption you end up with, it's, it's strong from whatever aspect you look at. And the problem with these NIST curves, we don't know how those initial numbers were selected. And there may be some foul play involved, but maybe there isn't. Uh, the problem is that we don't know. So lots of people are, are nervous uh, about that. So th the reason why these two named curves are being adopted is because people don't like the uncertainty. And then uh, the, 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 some cryptographers I've spoken with don't believe that there's a backdoor. But because no one's explained the, the reasoning behind, the, the, the logic behind, it's better to just replace them and then rather than sort of leave it, leave it hanging. So curve 25519 and curve 458 have been adopted after I think more maybe about two years of discussion on, uh, on the IETF working groups. And these are going to be the standards going forward. And uh, I think what's going to happen is that browsers are now supported. It's only curve 25519 is only supported in Chrome. And then um, a software, server software is going to be extended to use to prefer one curve if, if it's available and then fall back to the older curve if, it's, if, the, if a better curve is not available. Uh, the, the NSA hasn't helped um, the, the whole situation because one of the leaked documents was, I, I, if I remember correctly, um, they have a bu yearly budget of about $250 million to break standards and to subvert standards. So it's reasonable to expect that they, they may have spent some of that money to subvert, uh, subvert what, what, we're using, what we're using today. So the community is being act, extra careful about it. OK, so we are running close to the end of the module. So um, I, I think the HTTP specific advice they have is quite interesting. And perhaps it's going to be the most relevant that I have for you. Uh, personally, I think the TLS configuration is quite, quite straightforward, unless you have a a very highly secure websites, which most of us uh, don't. However, at the HTTP level, um, there are certain things that you can't make secure uh, by configuring a, configuring a TLS well. And, and that's a big problem. So there are some attacks that you will have to take care of in, in code, in your code, which is why I, I'd like to talk about uh, that. So the first problem here is cookie security. Um, the cookie specifications predate everything else that we've done uh, uh, when it comes to security, um, and they're quite lax. And the thing is, if you have two websites, if you have a website, say, www.example.com, and then you have another website, blog.example.com, chances are whoever takes over the blog one can create cookies that will be consumed by the, the, the www.example.com website one. So what basically means is that any related sort of neighboring website that shares the same domain name with your main and most secure web application can be used to uh, attack you. It, it, it actually gets slightly worse. If you think about someone who has a man in the middle, middle position on a network, what they can do, they can intercept all plain text connections. Any plain text HTTP link they intercept, they can redirect, so they can simply uh, operate as a web server, pretend to be a web server, and they can redirect and send that victim to any other, any other address. And actually, they can uh, invent a host name that doesn't exist. So if you have your www.example.com, there's actually been in the news an attack against Facebook. They, re they redirect the victim to, you, to a host name that has four Ws, Ws, um, Ws, uh, uh, instead of three. So for most people who, I mean, when you look in the, in the, in the you know, browser bar, um, that, that's just a web, uh, Facebook website, right? Uh, however, what that attacker can do then, they can take all the cookies that, 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 that may have been sent by Facebook. Also, they can, again, posing as a web server, create new cookies, which are then sent to the user, to the user's browser, and then later on, when the user goes to the real Facebook, those cookies are injected into the Facebook application. And there's many, there's, there's several attacks uh, that, uh, no, that, that could be carried out. I enumerate all the attacks in, the, in, the, uh, in my book, but I'm not going to do it right now because the solution is much simpler than trying to understand all the attacks. The solution is always is to, uh, first of all, make sure that you're using 100% encryption, but that, that's a given. The solution is to use 
a, a new uh, feature called strict transfer security. And when you enable strict tra transfer security, uh, what you're actually doing, you're giving instructions to web browsers to never use plain text to communicate to web your website again. So if you, have, if, you are, if you are Facebook, what you should be doing is enabling strict transfer security uh, over the entire domain name space. So if you have a man in the middle, they can redirect all they want, but if your browser sees a plain text link, it will just convert it into an encrypted link and it will attempt it. And be, the man in the middle, because they can't forge a certificate, a working certificate anyhow, um, then uh, they will not be able to exploit your application. So that's one very important aspect to deal with cookies. Of course, to properly, uh, there's one very basic thing that you need to do. You need to make sure that all your cookies are secure. And how you do that is simply append the word secure to every cookie that you generate. So that's the basic. So you do that, you enable strict transfer security, and if you operate a, a web application that uh, has to be really, really secure, what you do is you use either cookie signing or cookie encryption. Cookie signing is whenever you create a cookie, you append a cryptographic signature to the value. And then that cookie goes out, goes into the browser. When the cookie comes back to you, before you do anything with the cookie, you take a look at the signature and you ver verify the signature. The signature will verify the value. And if the signature validates, only then you can consume the cookie. And this prevents a variety of attacks where uh, an unknown attacker may have uh, uh, taken, injected some value that wasn't generated by your application, but it's now injecting in, in, into, into it. If you can afford it, if you don't have any JavaScript that needs to consume these cookies, the best prevention is to encrypt cookies as well. And you perform both uh, encryption and integrity validation. And what you gain in this case is that no one will be able to see what's in your cookies. Because sometimes s s uh, sensitive data in is by mistake leaked in cookies, and that can be used against you in, in other ways. So that's about cookies. Uh, mixed content is, used to be a big problem, now it's sort of getting, uh, is going away. Browsers used to um, allow all sorts of mixed content. You know, uh, TLS was initially designed to protect the TCP connections, but browser actually operates, opens dozens of TCP connections for every single page. And within a page you have the HTML, which is the basic source code, but you have a bunch of cascading style ships, JavaScript uh, files, and so on and so forth. So today, to compromise a user session, you don't need to attack the main TLS connection. If there is a single JavaScript file that's being retrieved without any encryption, then the man in the middle will just attack that one JavaScript file and inject some malicious JavaScript into it and essentially take, take over the entire user session without having to compromise uh, security, uh, sorry, encryption at all. Uh, these days, uh, things have gotten much better. Today, uh, webs, uh, web browsers only allow mixed content if it's images. So they will download images if they're not encrypted, uh, but they will not allow anything else. This is still not safe. For example, someone could replace an image, and this has happened, where an image is replaced and there are some instructions for end users to do something which are written on the image and then some users will follow those instructions and uh, even type things for the attacker into the, user brow into the browser bar and that's how you, they, they might uh, um, attack the user. It's also possible that you know, you're communicating to Facebook to a website that you feel uh, is secure but maybe someone takes that plain text image and uh, replaces it with someone that contains a buffer overflow attack. And then even though you're sort of to talking to a secure site, you're still being exploited uh, by, by a man in the middle. Um, my recommendations for this, is, there are two recommendations, really. And strict transfer security, if there's one thing that you uh, remember from today's training, is that you have to use strict transfer security on, on all your websites. This one feature, uh, which is actually an opt-in, uh, makes TLS as secure as it was intended to be many, many years ago when it designed it. And it, it does two things. First, I already mentioned, if there are any plain text links uh, pointing to your websites, browsers will not follow them. Instead, browsers will rewrite them so that they are encrypted links and will then follow them. And that's crucial. Uh, it, it sort of works as a safety net uh, because even if you make mistakes in the design, 
of your uh, website and even if someone subverts your links uh, the browser will not uh, fall for the attack. Uh, more importantly what strict transport security does is prevent certificate warnings. So today the best way to attack someone um, is simply to uh, use a man in the middle position and uh, show them an incorrect certificate and users will get a certificate warning chances are about 50% of the users will click through and 50% will say no so which means that you have as an attacker a very good chance of compromising a huge, num huge number numbers <coughs> of users simply by doing no work at all this is trivial uh, to deploy this sort of attack is trivial to deploy fortunately once you enable strict transport security uh, that goes away and if an invalid certificate is seen on your website uh, web browsers will say we're sorry we're not allowed to go through because the site owner instructed us not to and this is really what's going to make your website hugely secure I cannot overstate this um, just I'm going to skip to the other slide um, strict terms of security doesn't uh, address mixed content in its entirety because it works only for the domain names you own and most complicated websites will use third-party resources and if there's a third-party resource uh, it may be downloaded without uh, enforcing full encryption and for this if you wanted to, to take care of this you have to use another uh, technology it's called content security policy this was predominantly designed to address cross-site scripting uh, and it's a way of giving certain policies to browsers and you say exactly what your website is allowed and not allowed to do in terms of <coughs> fetching content for other websites so you could say with a content security policy you could say you can you're allowed to get images from this uh, this website and JavaScript files from that website but you're not allowed to communicate it with any other service and this is uh, great um, because you can actually say to the browser to always only use encryption and I have an example uh, uh, which is uh, how you can do this uh, and, and this is the policy so basically what you're saying by default use only HTTP, uh, HTTPS links and then uh, this other line connect dash source is required because browsers support different protocols and the, the connect source is for web sockets so uh, this will be the, the, the default source one will work for HTTP links and connect source uh, will, will work for everything else I do have this bit there uh, this this example here was designed uh, has been designed as a drop-in policy you can just put in without breaking anything and this sort of reverts some of the additional uh, CSP protections which are good but people don't really want to break their websites if if they just want to fix mixed content so I designed this policy which is you know safe to use um, but in real life you eventually want to remove these which is basically you don't allow any JavaScript in the HTML page itself so JavaScript has to be isolated in, in separate <coughs> files and the second unsafe the dash evil is about disabling the evil uh, construct, construction in, in JavaScript so that's, that's the most interesting aspect of it and then there's some new features being added to CSP CSP is probably the part of web security that's most uh, uh, heavily uh, uh, developed these days they're adding new features uh, where you will be able to automatically upgrade all insecure requests no matter where they are so even if they are third-party websites apparently lots of people have uh, trouble rewriting all their websites to use secure links so it's easier to tell browsers to do it to, rather than actually go and fix the problems where they actually are and there's another uh, a feature being added which is basically block all mixed content this is, easy, easy, uh, this is a simpler way of doing this and probably more reliable rather than us trying to figure everything out we just say block all mixed content and, and that's done and one uh, last thing uh, I'd like to mention is public key pinning which is about the biggest weakness that we have in the PKA ecosystem uh, the problem that we have is that any one certification authority today can issue a certificate for any website in the world without actually consulting with the owner and we have hundreds of these CAs um, and some of them of course have better security and some of them have uh, worse security the security of the entire ecosystem is as weak as the weakest link in 2011 there was one CA called DigiNota 
whose security was so lax that one uh, attacker, we, we think it was one, one attacker, managed to completely infiltrate, I think they had six or eight servers that they used for certificate issuance. All of them uh, were completely compromised and the attackers um, uh, ended up with 500 fraudulent certificates for Google, Yahoo, Skype, Microsoft, every, basically every big site, website that you can think of. And this was just one CA, and the reason this worked is because browsers just trust all CAs equally. And this creates a big problem. I th personally, I think this is okay for consumer level security. And I think there's one line that I always uh, say uh, is that TLS ultimately was ultimately designed for consumer level security. Netscape engineers wanted to have to enable people to put in their credit card numbers into websites so they could buy things. Uh, 20 years ago, we didn't really know how important the internet was going to become, so we designed TLS. Remarkably, this system actually works quite well. Uh, you, you're not really hearing about anyone being attacked at the PKI or TL, TLS level. All the weaknesses are elsewhere, like phishing or, uh, or whatnot. Anyhow, but we do have a small number of very high-profile high websites that need protection, like everybody wa wants to uh, attack uh, uh, Google Mail, right? Um, and what uh, Google started to do some time ago, they started to deploy, they deployed this feature called public key pinning. And they did it in a proprietary fashion because they had Chrome and they had, had their own service. So what they did, they sort of informed Chrome about every possible private key that they, they were using. Um, and they did that because in, within each certificate there's, there's actually a public key corresponding to the private key, which is why it's called public key pinning. You make an inventory of all your public keys and then you create hashes of them and then you embed them in Chrome. And then Chrome had a list of these hashes and what happened, and this is exactly how the DigiNotor exploitation was discovered in 2011. <coughs> One user went to read uh, his email and couldn't get because Chrome refused to, to go to the Gmail website. And he complained about it. He, I mean, he, he didn't really, wasn't aware of exactly what was happening. He complained about it on a forum and eventually we learned um, that there was a fraudulent certificate. And then we started to, sort of, I mean, Google engineers started to research the, the, the source of the certificate, which led them to DigiNotor and the whole case uh, unraveled, all because of these public key pins or hashes that Chrome had. And uh, Chrome uh, still has this, uh, these uh, hashes uh, built in. Uh, these days, Firefox <coughs> has them too. And these days, there's also a standard called the HPKP um, that any website can use to pin their own public keys. This is a very powerful mechanism. It basically allows you to, uh, to uh, establish a unique crypto identity for your website and then uh, effectively instruct browsers to always require a matching identity in the future. If you do this, you limit the attack surface. Um, you, you can choose how much. But for example, one easy, relatively easy way to do this is to choose a couple of CAs that you trust and you pin to their public keys. Um, so if you remember, you have a chain. So this is your leaf, this is your server, and then that's, that's what, that, that is issued by some parent certificate. And this parent certificate belongs to your CE, CA. So in this certificate, there's a public key, and you pin to that public key. And suddenly, rather than any one CA issuing a certificate for your website, now, you are only allowing this CA to issue a certificate to your website. So typically how you do this, you select maybe three CAs, and you, you have three different pins. So you, you select, um, I don't know, whichever three ones are, are your favorite. So there isn't an attack, of, uh, attack surface of hundreds of these CAs. You've limited it to only three. If you want to do even more work, what you could do, you could pin to your own uh, identities and you can pin to the public keys that are inside. And this is, this, this is more work because now you have to make sure that these cryptographic identities that you've just pinned to actually survive. So you have to, uh, to be extra careful not to lose them. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I said earlier, TLS keys are not really important because you can always regenerate them, except if you're doing pinning. The thing is with pinning, 
if you're not able to prove your uh, crypto identity, uh, browsers will stop coming to the website, and that's all. And if you lose your keys, and if you lose, lose your, all your backups, uh, you will effectively be dead. And there, there, there won't be anything that you can do about it. Now, in the standard, what they actually require you to do, you have to have a backup, at least one backup pin. So when you're configuring uh, pinning, you have to have one pin that works, and one pin, uh, one pin that doesn't work. And the idea is that this one that doesn't work is for your backup keys that you're keeping in a different part of the world, basically, in maybe in, in many locations, because you never ever want to lose them. Uh, if you lose one set of pins, uh, keys, that's fine, you can recover from that. But if you lose both, then you can't. So pinning is a very powerful uh, feature. Together with strict ransom security, pinning brings TLS to a, in, in, along with TLS 1.2 and PKI, um, to a very, very secure uh, uh, level. Um, and uh, it's really the question is, do you, actually, do you really require that level of security? I think for strict transport security, there is no doubt. Everybody must enable it. For pinning, uh, I think it's worth doing only for a small number of high-profile websites. Um, if you're at Google, Facebook, Twitter, and you know, similar websites, if you really have adversaries that might exploit a certification authority just in order to attack you, then pinning's for you. Uh, for most websites, uh, it's not. So this is a really... I think this is the end of my overview. I'm, I've eaten about uh, 15 minutes of the break. If you have some quick questions, um, uh, please ask them now. But if you have them, I can also answer them um, during the practice session. Okay, thank you. So let's take a break about 15 minutes, and then we'll continue.